take a look at depreciation. And again, recall that the basis, the foundational authoritative basis for depreciation comes from the FASB's Statement of Financial Accounting Concept Number 6 of a rational and systematic allocation. So you, an organization is purchasing an asset that it's going to derive benefit from over time. If you can think of this purchase of an asset as it is an investment. If it's not going to yield more in operating income, what have you, uh, creating more wealth for the shareholders, then the organization shouldn't invest in another asset, invest in this asset. So from a statement of cash flow standpoint, uh, a purchase of an asset is an investment. So let's take a look at the Lizzie Incorporated case study. And I highlighted this journal entry in yellow. We're looking at journal entry number four. This is way back, we studied this in uh, chapter three. The purchase of property, plant, and equipment. Lizzie Incorporated purchased equipment with a five-year life and no residual value for $5,800. So Lizzie decided, Lizzie Inc. decided that uh, it was a good investment to purchase some property, plant, and equipment that was going to derive some operating income in the future. So we're going to be working with two schedules here, two tabs here on the in the spreadsheet, the depreciation tab and the accrual calculations tab. So let's first take a look at the depreciation tab. And let's take a look at the date of purchase. That's July 1st. There's the cost of the asset, useful life of five years. Here's a useful life in units, which is another uh, kind of depreciation that we can do, and residual value. And I, I've left this open on, on the spreadsheet. You can play with this, change it around a little bit. Uh, this get, this uh, spreadsheet isn't bulletproof. You can change some of the numbers on it, and it'll uh, affect the journal entries. Uh, but it, it isn't perfect, so just keep an eye on it. But I am going to ask you to play around with this and and uh, buy some new assets, use different depreciation methods. So we're going to look at three different depreciation methods that are generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, straight line, the uh, double declining balance, or actually just called declining balance depreciation. You could do 150% declining balance or 175%. And finally, the units of activity depreciation. The uh, makers for tax purposes, which you may have studied in business math, modified asset cost recovery system that the IRS specifies all companies use, is very similar to double declining balance depreciation, but uh, uh, it is not generally accepted accounting principles, which is why most companies are going to keep tax depreciation records uh, as well as their gap depreciation records. So let's start uh, and look at straight line depreciation and things that we need to know. Uh, the calculation of straight line depreciation is here, the cost minus the residual value divided by the time in years or month. And, and this is going to give us our depreciation schedule. This is a minimum that you need to create. Anytime you have a problem, even if it's a, a quiz question, this shouldn't take you more than, than uh, a, a couple of minutes to do, and you should get very fast at it. Create this, this depreciation schedule. Because what we like to do in academics is we like to say, well, what is the depreciation expense in year four? Uh, what is the net book value as of uh, July 1st, 2013? The other thing we like to do, you notice this, this is purchased on July 1st, not January 1st. Well, recall periodicity from chapter four that we studied. We have to cut off at the end of the calendar year. So we're going to have to adjust this depreciation schedule uh, for the year end at uh, December 31st. So we'll basically be cutting these in half. It's very simple, but it's something that, that it's an additional step that we make you do in financial accounting to make sure that you understand more than one concept and can apply these concepts. So here we have the purchase of the asset, and back here in the journal entry, there's the purchase of the asset for cash. So that's an investment, a use of cash on our, our statement of cash flows worksheet. And at December 31st, we need to record the depreciation expense because we used this asset to help generate revenue. So according to the matching principle, we're going to have to match the, the cost, the expense of this uh, asset against the revenues that it helped generate in the second half of 2010. So that 580, where did we get that from? Let's go to the depreciation schedule, and you see the depreciation expense for year one as of July 1st, 2011 is $1,160.
Well, this represents 12 months of depreciation. We only need six months of depreciation, so we're taking half of this. And this yields our journal entry. So if we look at our general ledger, we look at the, the uh, fixed asset, which is here somewhere. Uh, here's our property, plant, and equipment. There's the purchase of the asset of $5,800, and we have our accumulated depreciation of $580, and that would give us our net book value. I've got that at the bottom of the depreciation schedule. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. So here's the uh, the purchase of the equipment, $5,800, and uh, the accumulated depreciation that was recorded on December 31st with journal entry number 15. The, uh, the net of those two is going to be shown on the balance sheet. Let's keep going over. Here's our balance sheet. Here is our property, plant, and equipment net, $5,220. That's our net book value. And that is an important concept because we're always going to include in the equipment account the historic cost, and that's what we always want to see. Accumulated depreciation is going to have the, all the depreciation expense that was recorded up to this period. If we didn't use a, a contra account accumulated depreciation, we would just be reducing the equipment account, and then we wouldn't be able to see uh, very quickly what is the, uh, the original balance, the cost of the equipment. So real quickly, we're going to look at two other gap depreciation methods, and these are not reflected in uh, the Lizzie Incorporated example, but you can use either one of these and create journal entries. This will change your net book value. It will increase your uh, depreciation expense recorded in 2010. First is the double declining balance. Very simply, uh, what you do with, the, with this methodology is you do not take into consideration the residual value at the beginning. We only care about that at the very end. We're going to depreciate this over its life of five years, but we're going to front load more of the depreciation expense. So this is our calculation, netbook value at the beginning of the year times two times the straight line rate. That straight line rate I put down here in a, a little schedule. So if it's a two-year useful life, the straight line rate is one divided by two, 50%. If it's a five-year useful life, straight line rate, one divided by five is 20%. So if you're using 150% declining balance, that 20% would turn into 30%. If you're doing double declining balance, it's 40%. So that's where we get that double declining rate. So that is our depreciation expense each year. You notice that we're front loading the uh, depreciation expense. We depreciate more quickly. But regardless, we make sure that the item is fully depreciated in five years. So I had to do a special, I had to uh, uh, put some additional depreciation expense in, in year five here. Next, let's look at the units of activity depreciation. This is almost precisely the same as straight line, except instead of dividing by years or time, months, we're going to divide by units of activity, which in this case we, did, we decided was going to be a 1,000 units of something. And we're going to uh, depreciate this, uh, this item uh, evenly over the 1,000 units. And you notice here units produced during the year, we actually produce uh, more than a thousand units with this item, but we stop depreciating. We get to thousand units in 2014 and we stop. Even though there's more units that are created in 2015 with this item, it's fully depreciated. And we, uh, we never depreciate beyond the residual value. In this case, we, des we uh, define the residual value as zero, uh, but you can go back and change this on the schedule. Uh, change the residual value to $500 or 1000 and you'll see what this happens, what happens to the schedule. So one other thing I wanted to deal with in the general journal, and I've done this down in, I've put it as, in, these are in purple, uh, I've recorded the depreciation expense for 2011, so this is an additional year. This is using the straight line rate, and you notice we take a half a year of, of year one depreciation and a half year of, you, of year two depreciation. In this case, they happen to be the same amount. So we add those two together and we record an additional year of depreciation. This is a, a very common trick. We're going to not purchase every asset on January 1 uh, or December 31st. We're going to make you calculate the portion of the year. And uh, it, it becomes a little more complicated if you're using double declining balance or units of activity, making sure you're getting things in the correct period. But this is what, uh, what we like to test. 
So don't uh, don't try and cut any corners. Make sure that you always create your depreciation schedule. You always know what your net book value should be at the end of the year, and you're adjusting the balances to these uh, to these uh, appropriate balances. For the example, at the end of of July 1, 2011, you know that your accumulated depreciation balance should be $1,160. Well, December 31st, 2010, it's 580. So if you were going to close the period at June 30th, you'd need to depreciate an additional 580 of, of expense and record another credit to accumulate depreciation of 580. So study hard. Uh, this, uh, this spreadsheet is available on Google Docs. Uh, get in and play with the numbers a little bit. Also make sure and take this all the way through to the statement of cash flows. Look and see how the, uh, the depreciation is treated on the statement of cash flows because this, the depreciation expense does not actually use any cash. What uses the cash is the purchase of the asset. So here on the cash flow worksheet, when we purchase an asset, we're going to show that, uh, that purchase as cash used in investing. The depreciation expense is going to be added back because that doesn't actually use any cash, but it's included in the expense uh, and reduces net income, so that has to be added back. And uh, that's covered a little bit more fully in uh, Chapter 6. So study hard. Hope to see you on Google Docs, and I hope you earn an A in financial accounting.